after. So, um, so okay. Well, uh, as already mentioned, uh, you have joined the abstract, Exploring Abstract Syntax Trees with ArangaDB and Sarah Hinkins, and I'll let her introduce herself, but we're very happy to have her giving this talk. And, um, and again, for anyone that just joined, feel free to ask questions as we go along the way. Take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, welcome everyone to today's webinar, where we'll be exploring abstract syntax trees with ArangaDB. Thank you for being here today. I'm Sarah Hankins. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a, so a staff software engineer, part of the core infrastructure team at Slack. My team focuses on the foundational components of the backend code. Imagine a software project as a Lego set. We ensure that the Lego pieces themselves are as of high quality and of consistency for other teams to build amazing things with them. So as I mentioned, I work at Slack, uh, which is an all-purpose communications platform for the workspace. It lets you share messages and files with your team organized by channel. Recently, we've also launched Clips, a new feature where you can record clips up to three minutes in length and post them in channel for your coworkers to see. In general, Slack is a new way to communicate with your team. It's faster, better organized, and more secure than email. In today's webinar, I will show you how we use ArangoDB as a critical part of an internal tool called Hack Census. It can perform code analysis with graph theory. It takes the source code of any project and turns it into an abstract syntax tree into a directed graph inside ArangoDB. On this graph, we perform queries to gain a deeper understanding of the patterns in our code base. We will start off today with a brief introduction to abstract syntax trees, commonly also referred as AST. They are usually the result of a syntax analysis phase of a compiler. Next, we will talk about the JSON document representation and how we model the AST in our AngoDB. After data modeling, I will show you how we architected a data pipeline that processes over 1.5 million functions and classes. During the demo, we will explore the ArangoDB dataset of an open source documentation site from Facebook themselves, describing how HackLine itself works. And lastly, let's talk about the future of Hack Census and a moment for me to answer any questions you may have. So when parsing a source code, the first step that happens is the parser generating a concrete syntax tree. This is a tree representation of the grammar of the program. That will in turn gets converted into an abstract syntax tree, which represents the logical implementation of the program. So our concrete syntax tree is how the program looks to, to the developer while the abstract syntax tree is how the program looks to the evaluator or the compiler. So in this example, on the top right, you see a code snippet of a while loop with some if conditions. On the left, you see the ASD representation of that snippet. Let's take an example. On the left, you see a comparison block called compare. That's the expression for comparison and the operation is a non-equal comparison. This expression takes two nodes underneath it, one on the left and one on the right. On the left, in this case, it's gonna be the variable named A. You can see this also, uh, and on the right, you see a constant value zero. So this is a comparison logic that defines if A is not equal to zero. Now, a more advanced example is on the far right you see a blue box that's called a sign with a red arrow. This represents a variable assignment. That's what the assign operation refers to. On the left part, you have variable B, while on the right, now you have another expression. Um, this in turn is a bin operation of a decrement between two variables. As you can see, this is a very verbose representation of the source code which is easily traversable by a computer, but it's not great for humans, but it's exceptionally great for computers. 
Hack Census operates on this AST tree that we extract from the language's own parser code. So at Slack, we use the hack programming language. Um, so if you take PHP and combine this with a type language like Rust or Go, and they had a baby, then you get Hackline. Hackline is a, or also known as Hack, is a PHP derived language built by Facebook. It is implement, its implementation is fully open source and it supports many more ways to describe types in your code base than just PHP by itself. It also comes with a built-in type checker to ensure your code is correct. It allows both dynamic and static typing, um, which gives you the same fluidity of old school PHP while providing many of the guarantees of, of modern programming language thanks to its tab checker. So here are some examples of hack code. Um, on the left, it's a bit more advanced use case with um, availables and some um, Lambda functions. On the right, you have a simple class representation. Fun fact, the right side is actually followed PHP 7 code because PHP now has types themselves as well. Um, before we dive into the concrete um, data modeling of Graph of our graph. Um, any questions so far about ASTs? So far, so good in the Q and A. Perfect. Thank you. So, the data model focuses on the connections between the components. We don't analyze the branches of a function. So, if you have an if statement and a while loop inside a function body. We do not want to extract that information. That is too verbose for the use case of our call stack modeling. Uh, we only care if that function is calling another function somewhere in the code. Um, this model can be broken down into two main buckets. The first is identity of the component. This is describing the name, um, it's, and also its behavior, and how it works, and how it, like how its inputs and outputs are. While the second bucket is the, are the contextual relationships between components. These are the call size. These are the relational relations between all the code that makes your program work. Now, luckily, these can be mapped one-to-one -to, -one to the primitives of our AngularDB. Collections are the identity of components. These are the files, functions, interfaces, classes, and methods. They con all the metadata to describe its purpose. While the edges um, indicated as the lines between the two, uh, between all the components here, they describe the relationships between these components. Let's take, for example, the, the method of edge on the far left. Notice that the method points to class and uh, described as method of. This indicates that the method is part of a class. Because as you know, in programming languages, a method cannot belong to multiple classes with exceptions for other programming languages that have special features for that. The same goes with implements. A class can implement an interface. Um, we design these edges, their direction specifically to what the wording represents. So a, met a method is a method of a class. A class implements an interface. An interface is defined in a file. Now, from the ArangoDB's perspective, the direction of these edges, they're not that important because ArangoDB can traverse the graph easily in both directions, regardless how your edge is designed. Um, Notice that the method does not have an edge to the file. So this is not a mistake on a slide deck. This is on purposely designed because a method by itself cannot exist. It's always part of a class. So the method of defines that the method belongs to a class while the class itself is defined in a file. So we inherit the location for the file nodes inside the method component to its class. Um, these edges contain the relative location information to each file. Um, so for example, if a class is defined on 
if you have a file with five glasses, the first glass is on line 10, while the second glass is on line 50, the line 50 is defined as a property on the defined in edge. So the relative information belongs on the edges, not on the components. This decoupling of identity from location allows for faster editing of the graph without having to modify all the collections. Now, let's dive into more detail of each of these collections and edges and how we represent them in a HangoDB. Let's start off with files. This is one of the simplest concepts. Um, the identity of a file. So what is the identity of a file? Well, essentially it's the name of the file. It's where it's located on the file system. So for the files collection, we have a property called file which has a relative path to the actual location of that file. Now, what about behavior? What's the behavior of a file? Well, it's a bit difficult for files because they don't define logic by themselves. But there is some information we can extract that defines this behavior. And one of the things we implemented at Slack is extraction of the literal values. So a literal value is, as it describes, a literal value you put in source code. If you just have a string that's called cursor, that is considered a literal string value, while a number is considered a literal integer. We extract this information into a graph because this makes for great for indexing and searching in the future if you want to search through your code. Now, the third concept is the metadata. The metadata is augmented information that we add with the main logic, uh, with the main knowledge into the graph. Um, this is not coming from the ASD, um, the abstract syntax tree. This is coming from an intermediate process we built on top of these ASD parsers that add additional properties that, is, um, that can be generated from the existing data. Let's take an example, the generated flag, the second from the top. In this case, it's false. So in our model generated refers to that this file was not manually written by a developer. A common use case could be if you have JSON schema specifications, we can code generate a class that validates the schema in a language of choice. So these cases, these are generated code classes and we emit these as generated flags into our graph to make it easier for filtering or selecting these specific types of files. Um, files are used as anchor points in the graph, a stable node that links to other components. Now let's move on to the functions. The functions are one of the simpler components, again, um, before we go into classes. Functions, the identity, again, it's name. So at the bottom, you can see the name is called users create. This gets emitted into the RangoDB database as a property called name with the name users create. Well, its behavior is all about its inputs and outputs. Remember, we don't care about what happens within the function. We only care about its inputs and its outputs and its behavior between those two sets of values. So let's talk about the returns first. If you look at the source code, it returns an awaitable user. This type can also be seen at the top in a document as a type awaitable user. Notice that the text could be on a separate line. It cannot be on a single line. Um, that's the value of extracting this information into a, an actual object is that we don't care how it's written in the source code. We only care about what its behavior is, the abstract behavior. The second set of behaviors are the parameters. Um, you can see these as a positional array into the data set. This again leverages the multi-model behavior of a HangoDB. We can have sub-collections in a single collection while the top collection is part of a graph. Um, this is where we act as a document store within. Very powerful features of a HangoDB. Um, as you can tell, the first parameter has a name, team, and it has a type, team object. While the second param is named with a type, string. And the third one is a question mark integer. This is the syntax and hack line to define, this is an optional value, this can be null. So this is defining this H can be the null or an integer. Um, so let's talk about metadata again. So similar to files, 
we augment the information with additional information we can extract from the ASD. Now, notice that there is a new property called async. Async stands for asynchronous. Um, in this case, we analyze the return types of a class or a method or a function. And if it contains an elevatable or in the JavaScript, also known as the promise, then we mark the async flag as true. This again allows us to do faster graph traversals and indexing without having to analyze all the return statements in the source code. Um, so let's move on to classes. So for a class, again, simple, the identity becomes the name of the class. While the behavior and the, con the behavior in this case, there's no methods, there's no functions. Commander, a class belong has multiple methods, but those methods are in a separate collection. So the class itself has some behavior. It has properties and it has constants and it has some other interesting values like where it extends from. So that's the behavior in the class, in the class example. Um, let's talk about constants. Notice that the constant in the class is just an integer, default port. That's embedded into the graph as, again, a sub-collection of the class document. And next, the properties. Um, in PHP, or in Hack, you can define properties in two ways. One, as a argument in the constructor with a visibility option, or explicitly in the class definition itself. So there's two ways to emit the properties of a class we have consistency in our document to make sure we only have one representation of that. So in this case, we don't care how you specify the property. We only extract, hey, you have a property that has a visibility of public. Its type is a RangoDB client and its name is client. So we bring consistency in the data set without having to worry about the intricate details of how the source code is written. And for methods, very similar to functions, we have a name, um, which is create document emitted as a name property in the graph. Um, and you have your return statement, which is all again emitted into the graph as the return statement. And you have your parameters. Um, so notice that this dictionary, it has a type string and mixed, while the dictionary in the code is just without the namespace. Notice that in our data set, we have the HH in front of it. So the dictionary class is part of the namespace called HH. We always generate the fully qualified namespace name of any type of function in our data set. Um, this allows us to ignore all the namespace imports, ignore any aliases, and we only care about the true, concrete, fully qualified name of an object. This allows us to have no conflicts in naming or unique values. Everything is uniquely global and it's consistent as an absolute fully qualified name. So call edges. So the call edges are the one of the more expensive more complicated items. On the bottom, you see we call, a con we call the connect method on the database. But if you remember from the first slide, we have this ASD and, and, a, and a call edge is, can be very complicated with all these properties and expressions. So let's take a little refresher of what is an ASD. Uh, so this was the ASD from the first slide. Um, it's abstract syntax tree. Or ASD is a logical representation of the source code. It is made of a bunch of expressions. All right, let's continue back to our example course to from the college. At the top, we have an instance of a database object which performs a method call to a method called connect. This in turn takes in a couple of arguments and assigns its result to a local variable result. So the first thing that happens is we have an assign operation, the equal sign. It takes a left and a right expression. The left is just a local variable, also abbreviated as LVAR. Its name is result. On the right side, you have a method call. Next, this method call can be further decomposed into its three arguments. 
The first one is a primitive. We're just saying literal string localhost. The second is yet another function call. And the third is reading from a local variable. And finally, the get env function call also takes it in argument. This is that line of code, the call site, fully decomposed into its AST. In reality, there's much more information attached in this tree representation, uh, but this covers the basics of it. Now, let's talk, about, uh, let's talk about types and expression types. So these are the expression types. An expression type is describing what you're doing in that specific spot. For example, we have a primitive, so the expression type is a primitive. While the second argument, the expression type is a function call. While the third argument in this function call is a local variable access, like accessor. So, okay, those are the expression types. What about the values? What's the value of these things that go into this method call? Well, the primitive is easy. The primitive is just a string because localhost as a it's just a string representation. While the second one, that type is going to be defined by the result set of the function called get env. Now, what about the third one? So we can't really see from there what's the support coming from. What's the value of this of this for local variable? So that, for that, we have to kind of look back into the tree and see what happens before this function call. So let me add that other snippet in front of it. We assign the value of 5,000 to our port. Now that's a separate line of code. So it has its own separate assign operation. This is the assign operation of the port value to the primitive of 5,000. So the type checker and our graph can now infer that this is the integer of 5,000 because we use the same local port vi local variable called port in the same code snippet. So, so this is kind of like quick refresh of ASTs and how we can identify the type information of function calls. So let's go back to our RangoDB data model. Let's talk about the first argument again. So, well, before you go to the arguments, let's, just, let's talk about identity. So this is not a, a component in our graph. The, the, the identity of an edge is a combination of where it's coming from, where it is going to, and what the behavior is between those. In this example, it will be the from and the to at the top of the document, in combination with a line number and a column. Remember, this is that contextual information of where this function call is being called from. Now let's talk about behavior. It has three behaviors, the three arguments. The first one is represented as an object in the arcs sub, sub um, collection. And as you can see, the expression is a literal type. It has the type itself is a string because it's localhost. Well, we can also infer its actual concrete value because that's a generated metadata value that we analyze based on, is this a constant? Is this coming from another variable? Is this defined as a literal in the function call? In those cases, we know it's always local host, so we emit it in a graph. Again, great for indexing, great for searching, and great for understanding how code works because you remove the, uh, the complexities out of it. Now, the second one, notice the expression is a call, so it's a function call. But now the type is this weird underscore value. So in Hacklang, and in our model, an underscore represents the type of I don't know. I don't know what this type represents. It's an undetermined value. And this sometimes happens because hackline allows for dynamic programming. You may have functions that do not return any type information. You don't know what they return. It could be a string, could be an integer, could be an exception, could be null. You don't know that. And in this example, the get env function is the standard method within PHP that returns the value of an environment variable. This, cat, this function has no return type. So we don't know what the return type is. At Slack, we call these unsafe argument operations. And notice that we have a third property of an expression called unsafe. 
This is a metadata field that is generated from this specific type information. If it's in any way, shape or form, having any type inside of it that's unsafe, like an underscore, we mark the expression as unsafe. This allows us to find all unsafe call sites and do analysis on a code base of what's the blast zone of these unsafe, unsafe code operations. That allows us to clean up the code a bit better and add type information. And the third one is, again, the local variable. Um, this is a variable being called um, on a local scope and it's good added in the, in the actual document. So this is the overview of the basic documents on our graph. Uh, there's many more. There will be more added in the future, um, but these are the essential core anchors in a graph where we always operate on. So let's like talk about how we get to this. So how do we convert the source code into this data model in HangularDB? The first step we do is parsing the source code. We use Hacklang's own tab checker to give us intricate detailed access into the internal data structures. And these internal data structures represent these expression trees, these A abstract syntax trees. Next, we extract this ASD information into JSON payloads. Um, so we can extract this into a common, lang a common um, schema used by the next step in the pipeline, which in turn processes this information. It will look at the data, it will determine whether this is an unsafe operation or it is an async operation. It augments it with domain knowledge from Slack or from anything else that you might integrate in that system. And the final step is importing. This is a lot of code that we have to import into, into a HangoDB. Um, the importer has a caching layer inside of it that will do effective and efficient absorptions into the graph to make sure we can import everything into a really, really fast performance system. So let's talk a bit about the import and the entire hack sensor system. So this is a previous slide, a bit more detail. On the left, you have your code. On the right, you have your RangoDB data sets. It all starts with code being parsed by parsers. These are individual programs running in parallel um, on one per CPU core. Because our system is built so it can scale horizontally across many, many machines. Because um, we need to process 1.5 million function calls. Um, we can do this in 10 minutes with this system, which is surprisingly fast. And that's just because of the 16 core machine um, optimizing for CPU um, multiprocessing. In front of the parsers sits the coordinator. The coordinator is that bridge between the raw parsers that are language specific to it converts it into a common schema that we can store in a RangoDB. The coordinator takes the parser data, it augments the data, and then stores it into a RangoDB. It also has an in-memory caching mechanism that allows it to do faster, comparisons and lookup tables uh, with, a, with an other U cache in front of it. So it, it knows what the most common functions are and it remembers those edges so it can, can be much faster in analyzing the changes necessary to bring the graph up to date. Um, so this is all written in multiple languages. They are specifically purpose for what they do. The parsers are OCaml, the coordinators are Golang, and the hack type checker is Rust and, Go and OCaml as well. So it's a very interesting, intricate system, but it's fast. And it's optimized for data extraction and data import into a RangoDB. So this is a graph from Slack. This is how Slack's code base looks like on the right. It's this iceberg with a lot of code underneath. Notice that on the right side, you see the sliver of code that seems to be disconnected from the graph. Um, on the left, it's a zoomed in view of this. This is looking at the um, Slack graph of functions and methods and classes that are never called. 
this is essentially that code that can be deleted from the code base. Uh, notice that it has some patterns. Um, for example, the top left, the little star, the ball, that was a new generated object that's based on JSON schema. And every little snippet around that center node is just an implementation of a class, but we are not using that yet in our source code in our runtime environment. So it's separated out as a graph. So this is great to identify analyzing your code. So, so that's the, uh, the Slack graph itself. So let's go into a demo. Let's, let's pray for the demo gods and hope they're all happy today. And we'll show you how this works in the HangryDB. Um, for example, today, we will be using the official hack documentation website. So this is the documentation website that describes how to use Hacklang. This is a source code of this documentation site. In source, this is full of PHP code and Hacklang code. And we're gonna analyze this. We're gonna extract this information and see how this looks like in the graph. So I've done this import yesterday and this is a loaded database of HangarDB. So this is the UI of HangarDB um, available with every installation of HangarDB. And notice we have our calls, we have our objects, etc. So let's start looking at an example. Um, let's, for example, look at the lab controllers. So we'll go into a class filter and I'll go pick one that I know of. <laughs> That's not the correct one. So this is an example of the web controller. So the, on the right side, you see the actual concrete code, a web controller, it has a consistent construct. Um, attribute, you can see that here, it has a cons consistent um, construct. So this is a JSON representation of the behavior of this class. So you can see all the properties, what the type is, whether they're static, final, abstract, or whether it's like in the test files or not. So this is very powerful to find all the source code. I have to restart my HangarDB because it's running out of memory. <laughs> there you go. So these are all the call sites. We have 3000 call sites in our source code. Uh, these are all the simple documentation sites, but you can see they have arguments and they have expressions and columns. Um, now, this is great for tabular data. Let's see how this looks like um, in actual graphs. So let's start with um, the extents, the inheritance. The inheritance is describing all the classes and where they extend from. Uh, let's start at a single node that I'm aware of. I'll set this and I'll set this to 10. So it's the one and then set this to name. So this is me configuring the actual viewer of a HangarDB. Great. So this is that same a web controller class. And notice that this is a controller that extends from web controller. And there's also methods that are part of this. Now, what I can do is I can go to the non heritable controller expand the graph, and now we can see more details. This web page controller has all these methods, and it also has another extents. And extend this, and you can keep navigating through this entire graph until you end up having everything available. So this allows you to navigate visually what your source code looks like. Now, another good example is call sites. So remember this, the last one was the call edges. If you go to call sites and then we, we can select a node that we are familiar with, set the name, I have to set this to 10, 21. So here's our method call of the guides class. Um, while this is loading, I'll show you this code. So this is the guide class, the guides class, and it has this method called the normalize name. This method, um, I'm testing, this is 
See, the Dhamma gods are not happy with that. It's like they're all dancing for me now. Let's switch to that GL. There we go. So this normalized class, it calls the string method. It calls the UC words method. It also calls a search. And we can keep expanding this. And this keeps calling, and this one calls more information, and this one calls more information. So we can again navigate our entire graph to see what a call stack looks like. Um, a great example is loading the entire graph. So if we load, let's say, a thousand and a search depth of five, and then we wait for the graph to load. Load the full graph. That's the entire code base of and all the call sites. This is representing the entire collection of logic. And you can zoom in, and you can zoom in, and you can see all these connections. Now, there's a little bug in the background here of the editor, so it doesn't show you the correct information, but you can see all these lines around. So great, great for visualizing and diversing graphs. So, so let's do some queries for this. So how do we use this concretely in, in our code base? So let's start off with um, exploring the actual inheritance tree. So let's say for class, in all the classes, we filter the class name, and it has to be, let me refresh this to clear the memory. And then we say we want the web controller, the web controller. I will just return this class. We return the object, and now we see the entire payload of that class, the web controller. We have its properties and all this information. Now let's say we want to know what are all the direct children of this class. So for this, we're going to leverage graph to first level identity. We say for vertex address and the path in one distance from the inbound of my of the class with the extent edge. So this is saying start at the class, look for all the edges that are inbound on this object of the type extends. And then these two these three variables contain information about each step in that graph traversal. And then let's say we return the vertex. And you can remove this. If you run this now, you see that six classes that directly extend from our main web controller. So Let's go deeper. Let's find all the classes that extend from this somehow. So instead of direct children, let's look at all the classes that extend from other classes. So for this, we say do the same graph to first of all, one to five edges far away. And if you run this again, you see now you have 17 elements. You have 17 classes extending from the web controller. Um, so now we can do some really, really fun and interesting items. Um, for example, let's, let's count the, uh, let's count the distance from each of these classes to their parent. So if you have um, class A extends class B, and then this one extends class C, you wanna know, how much hops is there to the root? The, one of the classical um, shortest path kind of queries you could do in a, in a database. So first of all, as I mentioned, the path contains all the steps you took from the start to the end of your graph traversal. So you can just assign these to, let's do all the parents and assign this, all the vertices in our path. And then we can um, modify this return value to be the name of our final class is going to be vertex.name and all of its parents 
are all of the parents and their name. So this is an interesting syntax saying for each value of this collection, get a value from each of them and extract as a list. So if you run this, ah, I got an error message. Ah, see, pad, pad. Now we can see the list. Great, we have a jump controller, which in the pad always contains itself at the end. So jump controller, and then you have the web controller. Then if you go further down the list, API method page, it extends the API page controller, it extends the web page controller, then extends to the non heritable web page controller, which then extends to the web controller. Um, so great, we have our information. But notice that we want a distance value integers. If you just sum these up, we actually also including ourselves. So this is really a one, this is of one, not two. Well, this is a distance of two, not three. So to do that, we are going to remove ourselves from our parent list. And there's a little neat trick in HangryDB that you can do this by saying, on this array, we're gonna pop the last value off. and return the remaining. So if you run this now, you see now the parents are web controller and the non of the controller. Now, let's now again sort this. You wanna know what are the more, the far distant objects from this class. Um, so to do this, we are going to be saying the distance. We can say the letter distance. equal the length of a pan. And if we say sort the distance incrementally. And we also add the distance in our object to turn back. On this, now we can see the API class page controller is a distance of five because that's five, like a total of five. Um, perhaps, well, these ones are two. Now, because our distance is counting all the values in our parents, we also have to do um, the distance here. We want to say the parents instead. So if you do the parents, which is a variable we reuse in this other function, we now have the correct value. So this is a distance of one, while each be four and four, so this is of two. Um, so this is great as a JSON object. Let's say we want to actually run this as an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, we, Excel does not support these sub-nested lists. So another great feature of ArrangoDB is you can, cut, you can concatenate um, data together. So you can say concat separator. Uh, we say the separator has to be a comma. We get all the parents' name, and now this can be can be completely exported as a list, for example. So this is one example of finding um, the distance of certain API controllers. Um, so another example, and I'll be very quick with this one, is let's say we want to find all of the functions. So all of the functions, all the methods, you wanna say all the functions that are in the source directory, say filter functions of file, it starts with in a path source, um, find all of the colors. So we go assign a variable and we do for each call, where's the color actually like this, like part of this. Get the length of the colors um, and say we want only care about the ones that the total is more than zero. Um, and, we, and we sort this by total decrementing and then we return these values. Return. Function. 
name, run down num colors. Um, total. So now you can see what are the most used functions in the code base. Log i is called by 36 call signs. Now remember from the slide that we had this really interesting concept of an unsafe argument. If the unsafe argument contains an unsafe type, we can further reduce this list of colors to say, for all the colors, filter this list based on this condition. And the condition is the current, if any of the arguments is unsafe, so that's how this represented in HangryB, let's count them all up. So these are all the unsafe values. And now we can say, okay, now we have this. Let's also say the risk value is how many of those unsafe, how much, what's the percentage of all the total call signs? Then we can say, okay, sort by risk. And now you can return all this information. And now you can see, um, let me remove this one for a second. Now you can see these are all the risky methods. For example, the log print, there's four calls to them, but three of them are unsafe because they receive type information that may not exist. And the same goes for these. Now these are all safe. So this is great for doing risk analysis of the code base based on this legacy function, um, it has 95% unsafe call arguments. Let's investigate and fix this up because an unsafe value is just a type information that Hackline says, I don't know what this is. We'll let it just throw an error in the runtime if it runs an error, but we cannot guarantee the consistency of that at the tab checker level. So these are the two demos that I showed today. Um, so as you can see, the options are endless and we keep finding new and new novel ways to use this graph. It's like to do code analysis, like that code detection, um, risk analysis and identifying why a certain function changes over time. Now, what comes next for hack sensors? Um, first of all, we will continue expanding the graph. We wanna continue adding more support for the language features of Hackline and in the future also different languages. Um, it's not complete yet, it's a work in progress. Next, we also want to introduce time travel. So time travel is a unique data model in graphs where your edges can have history. This allows us to explore the code base from five years ago or from three commits ago. And you can see this method, how many call sites did it evolve over time? What was this call site a week ago versus now? we can time travel the code base, the graph. And finally, we will also be open sourcing this project to the community in the future, once we are ready to release it to the public. So thank you all uh, so much for joining us today and listening to my webinar about exploring abstract syntax trees. If you're interested in joining our team at Slack, check out our many open roles on our Gaius page. Now, does anyone have any questions for me today? Thank you, Yushan. Awesome. Well, um, if there are any follow-up questions, um, what's uh, is there a good way for people to reach out? Uh, or I know you're on the ArangoDB community Slack. I guess that might be a way to <laughs> follow up. Yes, yes. Join the ArangoDB official community site so Slack. And I'll be this by name, Sarah. Um, and yeah, let's talk there if you're interested. Um, Awesome, and, and uh, thank you again for the presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I think it's a, a really cool use case, and I'm definitely excited to check out the data set as well, infinitely, since uh, you, now you said this data set's already available, like the dump of the RongoDB Arangu, database? Uh, yes, so I will be making a public dump of this database so people can explore this themselves by storing the database on this specific code base on Hackline. Excellent. And, um, 
then uh, other than that, yeah, definitely thank you again uh, for taking the time to, to give the pre presentation. And will there be a recording? Yes, we'll definitely be doing a recording. And I believe should be on YouTube as well on the OrangoDB channel. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, we'll send that around as well to anyone that signed up. They should receive a follow-up email once the recording is live. Um, and then if there's anybody watching that has a, a similar interesting use case that they'd like to show off, either something that they worked on with their company or even just personal projects, we're always happy to, to set up these webinars or even uh, possibly with our Community Pioneer program um, to give another talk like this. So um, other than that, thank you again, Sarah, for, for your time and effort. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.